All right, I want us to uh, look in Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 to 36. Uh, I've been seeing um, a sort of a spiritual ramifications of these verses as of late. And I mentioned this a couple weeks ago in my opening words, citing it as an example of things that Christ said that uh, had a greater meaning than what is initially and physically seen. I want to make sure I'm faithful in saying that I am not opposed to uh, the things that are, that are in these verses, which I um, will actually go ahead and read. It says, For I was in hunger, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Now, I'm not opposed to being kind and doing good deeds. I'm not opposed to feeding the hungry, uh, giving to the poor, clothing those who need it, visiting the sick, helping the helping people. I'm not opposed to those things. Um, I've done many of these things myself, and no, I was, it was uh, very edifying to have an immediate, see an immediate effect. Um, however, these ver views of the verses, while they are good, um, there's actually a, there's a higher viewpoint of these things. Now, for this first part, I was hungered, and you gave me meat, thirsty, and you gave me drink. Now, if God, if God chose to um, judge us based solely on the physical, physicality of these things, it would, be righteous to, it would be righteous of him to do so. But considering the amount of revelation that says otherwise, uh, I find it difficult to believe that that is singularly what, uh, what these verses mean. In uh, Luke 4.4, 4, Jesus stated, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And when Christ, who is the Word, then goes on to say that He is the bread of life, that He has come that they might have life, and they might come, at more, come to have it more abundantly, um, it becomes more clear where the sustenance is derived. There is progression in spiritual maturity that constitutes knowing, which starts in spiritual infancy, that life is found only in Christ. Knowing where life originates is important to knowing that there are eternal con consequences involved. And Christ also spoke on living water, now, I've come to better understand uh, the, the story of the Samaritan woman at the well, uh, which is in John 4.10, and I just kind of accepted it uh, previously as, you know, as it says, like, living water comes from Christ, and which is true. But I've recently seen that in order for the Samaritan woman to request from Jesus the living water, she had to actually know who she was speaking with. You cannot request something from somebody if you don't know who they are. You cannot request Christ to intercede for you in heavenly places if you don't know that's where he is. In the Lord's Prayer, physical sustenance is mentioned once, and it is a recognition of the necessity of such a thing. Things like, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Such things are the bulk of the requests in this prayer. Requests that are of a nature that are in preparation for eternity. Now this next part, I was a stranger and you took me in, naked, and you clothed me. Now by inviting the strangers, uh, there are a couple things with that. We are able to protect them, protect the strangers from a danger that could belie them, as it was the case of Lot. Or it could also be a way that can lead to be receiving a blessing, such as the case of Elijah and the widow of Zarephath who bakes him a cake. The knowledge of the area in which you live, whether it is a good area or a bad area, puts responsibility on us to assist wayward travelers from falling into snares. In having them stay, you are offering them a protection from such things that would seek to destroy them. And in turn, we are able to fellowship with the fellow uh, brother in Christ. Now, the first instance of suitable clothing was from the Lord. So it's, uh, I find it difficult to believe that the idea of fig leaves or clothes made by man is what Christ was singularly endorsing here. Uh, Isaiah 61.10 says that God hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. Now this passage cannot simply be meaning giving physical clothing to those who need it. The Lord knows that we are in need of apparel that is suitable and purposeful, which is why he opened up the armor of God. Clothing does more than offer a way to cover shame. It is, protection, it is a protective barrier between you and that would, which would uh, be capable of harming you. Such is the case with the armor, which, when worn, enables you to push forward toward the mark. Now, as the final part, I was sick, and he visited me. I was in prison, and he came unto me. In his letters to the Romans, Paul addresses the flesh as an, inf as an infirmity, one that can disable the believer if it is allowed to take hold. Just as an antibiotic dissipates a virus, which natural antibodies cannot, the ministry of the saints to one another assists each other in putting off the old man. Romans 6.18 tells us that in doing so, we are being then made free from sin. 
This putting off of such things makes us better suited to building up the body, which in turn ministers unto those who are wrestling with an infirmity. When a believer is stuck in a system, which we specifically have known to uh, be Babylon, there is an imprisonment of sorts, which can lead to, a de to various degrees of sickness. When the word of God is not appropriately or sufficiently explained, there is a deficiency in understanding, which leads to these various bonds. These bonds hold us back and they keep us from growing. It is the kind of chain that pleases Satan. Knowledge of justification by faith is what enables the believer to overcome the guilt of their past. This guilt is a major hindrance to further understanding. Understanding the new man enables the believer to crucify the flesh and keep the old man crucified. To look for the way out of temptation. Without such knowledge and understanding, there is a reliance on the self to overcome such things. Now, uh, why did neither of these groups see these needs, and how is it possible then that only one group was capable? Well, when Christ spoke, he spoke in parables which have been defined as earthly stories with heavenly meanings, which is a good definition, but we are living in a time when parables have come to mean nothing more than earthly stories with a good moral lesson at the end. Christ did, did say, It is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. To them it is not given. The higher view, its heavenly meaning, is largely ignored by the populace because, unfortunately, they have not been given to see this higher view. In this parable, there is a correlation between the previous parable of the talents, in which each group has some sort of capacity. Each group was given, to, was given something to give to the believer. Those on the right, though they may not have known how they were doing it, had the capacity to properly do them. We have experienced this on an individual basis at times, where someone ministers to another, whether it's timed that way or not, or we have heard messages that sound like they were tailored to us and what we needed to hear at the time. But in edifying the body first, in, in, our, in our speaking, in our manners, the needs of the individual are more easily met. Those on the left, however, were not only unable to see the needs, they were unable to meet them because their intent was not to edify the body of Christ. So this morning I'd like to, to call us to uh, continually consider the edification of the saints and to continue pondering upon heavenly things.